other day, as I waited in the car outside ASK for another school pickup, I listened to a Radio Lab podcast. It was exploring the nature of everyday heroism. The winners of the Carnegie Medical Medal for Heroism were its subjects. And the question they were asking was, what do heroes have in common? The answer, surprisingly, was not empathy or pathological fearlessness or a drive to altruism. The common thread was that people who jumped into the fray, overriding their own emotions, to solve a life-threatening situation with a stranger had simply practiced doing the right thing their whole lives. And like skilled musicians, they were playing the piece flawlessly without being conscious of why. They did what they did because it needed to be done, and someone needed to do it, period. No greater reason. In fact, People who tested very high for empathy were not likely to be effective in a life-threatening situation. Over-identifying with victims, paralyzed to act, they imagined their own future plight. So this set my mind to thinking about something that has, I've thought about for many years because I've been working in the humanitarian field. Specifically, what is the nature of compassion? And how do you know it when you see it? What does it look like? And how do people learn to practice compassion? I've been in the position before of hiring young people um, to, to do humanitarian work in the field, dealing directly with people at risk uh, for one reason or another, or suffering from some situation of inequity. And I was frequently approached by passionate, passionate new grads who would beg to work with my program because they wanted to do good. They wanted to help people, saying they could only feel satisfied if they looked into someone's eyes and felt that they had changed their lives. These pleas were sometimes accompanied by tearful stories, illustrating the applicant's sensitivity to a particular marginalized group and a description of their own feeling of pain as they were exposed to this inequity. I did not hire these well-meaning applicants. To pursue humanitarian work in search of some sort of external reward, either from the recipients of your goodwill or from some greater spiritual goal, seems to me to objectify the people in your community who need some resources and do not have them at present. Unlike the acts of the aforesaid heroes, these young people were consciously striving to be heroes, to be heroic. There was a whole narrative and they were the center of that story. The story of how they were in relation to that future act of compassion they foresaw. It reminded me of a day I accompanied some people to distribute food to workers, and on the way back, the lawyers asked for videos from the volunteers to show the workers' conditions. But the videos were all of the volunteers distributing food, with the workers in the background, just a voiceless, faceless backdrop to the volunteers' efforts. Compassion is not about ego, or at least not ego as the reflection of ourselves in a narrative. You are not compassionate because you like the person in front of you, or you pity that person, but because you have internalized values of equity and social justice and you want to live in a world that reflects those values. It isn't about prioritizing one community over another, nor extending your resources to those that appeal to you. Nor is it a self-indulgent, feel-good pursuit. It is about partnership, and it is acted out in response to pragmatic requirements in a situation where there's a need 
and you can assist in addressing it. So, it turns out, I may have been right not to hire those highly empathetic applicants. There's a lot of research now that shows that empathy and compassion overlap, but are very, very different in significant ways. Tanya Singer and Olga Klemecki did a research study that explored what happened to the brain when it was exercising empathy and when it was exercising compassion. So, when participants were exposed to the suffering in others, an empathetic response led to distress, negative feelings, and eventually emotional disengagement. When people were experiencing compassion, a different part of their brain responded. A part that promotes pro-social behavior, positive affect, and resilience, leading people to deal better with stressful situations. So, to return to the heroes of my podcast. They were not military personnel or emergency medical health workers immune to operating in stressful situations. They were neighbors, teachers, passers-by, who could have easily been bystanders. They were certainly not heroes to themselves. They did, they did possess empathy, but they did not react after first assessing the impact of their actions upon themselves or because they would be owed some kind of gratitude or be part of a larger story. They reacted to a problem by offering up a solution and taking action without contemplating all the societal factors, prejudices or outcomes that might stop them. They reacted out of compassion and basic human decency, reflexively. And the research, researchers argued that reflex, that compassion reflex, was the result of years of socialization to do the right thing in any given situation. So the good news is we can actually train our brains to respond compassionately, moving from simple empathy to something more positive that gives us agency. So what if we took the research that's available to us, as the University of Virginia did with the Jefferson Public School System, and built a compassion training into our kindergarten through 12 curricula, with the daily meditations and dialogue, changing our students' very neurology, making them more resilient, happier, and proactive. Our schools engage our youth eight hours a day for 12 years, and they are the hub of their socialization. When students reach high school, they're suddenly expected to start doing service work in their communities, many of them for the first time, and they often do it just to check off a box on the application to an elite university. But we need to go for something deeper that transformative experience that makes our children say, I do this because this is who I am. And to be true to myself, I must act. I think we need to teach compassion to our children from birth, and we must model compassion and tell stories of compassion that resonate with them but it is really encouraging that there seems to be a new understanding of tools that we can use to actually empower our agency at any age. A daily practice would strengthen the ASK student's ability to live the values, practice compassion, make a difference, and learn for life. If we make teaching compassion central to our core values and taking action, and practice and integrate these into everything that we do, our students will go out in the world and know how to make a difference because it is who they are, they have always done it, and it is the right thing to do. Thank you. <laughs>